So Professor Salmon is a really internationally well-known ed tech and a digital learning pioneer whose uh, early books and, and other writings in the field are now uh, considered uh, quite seminal. Uh, I can remember, as I was just saying to Julie there, having an edition of the e-moderating book with a purple cover, probably about over 20 years ago now, and uh, very pleased to meet you recently at that uh, Australasian Society for uh, Computers and Learning um, event. Um, in addition to our books, Professor Salmon is also the creator of a, a learning design methodology called Carpe Diem, which has been uh, deployed extensively uh, around the world. Um, today, Professor Salmon is um, giving us a talk entitled Now and Next Thoughts, Models and Practice for 2021 and Beyond. And from what I've seen of her presentation and uh, chatting to her just now, it promises to be a, a provocative but also practical response, I think, to the so-called great onlining, the, the ongoing uh, disruption to traditional campus-based um, teaching and learning. So uh, over to you, uh, Professor Salmon, and uh, thanks very much. Oh, thanks very much for that introduction. Are you recording now, Paula? I am recording. Okay, super. Well, hello everyone, and thanks for that introduction. My mother would have believed all that stuff about me, but um, I have been long-term in the sector in a number of roles in a number of countries. And for the last year, um, I've been working around the world to support people in making the changes that are needed in response to the pandemic. Um, so most of what I'm saying is quite practical, but it is drawing on my research over um, quite a few years now. Um, so um, I'm going to talk probably 30, 40 minutes. Please put put anything you like in the chat about questions or comments, we'll pick them up. Um, and um, I, I'm likely to keep going on the flow, but don't worry, put them in there. I will put them up at the end and attempt to answer everything. Um, and don't worry about making notes unless you want to. I've left, I've left these slides with you. And as you heard, there's a recording as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about five key concepts that I think will help you um, to make the changes that are definitely needed in your learning and teaching, but actually... Of... Can everybody mute, please? Um, and uh, also that, that have been very well res researched over a long period of time. These are not things that we've invented during the remote learning period and during the pivot. They are things that have actually been researched. Some of you might not know that there are professors of education technology and there are journals and, you know, we do our research and practice in the same way as all of you in the different disciplines do too. So um, I'm going to talk about these things. Um, the importance of, of design, the importance of equivalence, how to engage students and, and create a true experience for them online, and then just a, a nod to the future that's not about COVID. So here we go. Um, so you probably have heard of threshold concepts. You almost certainly know what the threshold concepts are for your own discipline, your own teaching. They are, they're not really grand theories, but their experiences uh, related to the key knowledge from your discipline or profession that help you uh, to see the world differently. I see it as jumping through a portal. Um, and, and so there are some that I think it's helpful um, for all staff in university teaching to have at this point. Um, and so much of the way we teach is simply based on the way we learnt, the way we've done it forever, whether we've had a long or short career. And mine's been long, so mine's quite well embedded. 
Um, and typically we've had super resources on campus. We've often had a huge amount of autonomy. And a lot of what we've decided to do during the semester has been based on room schedules, if we can get a parking space, um, contact hours, and very much focused on our knowledge, what we know we need to teach and what we're desperate for our students to learn to succeed. Now, none of that needs to go, um, but it does need to be delivered and understood somewhat differently where some or all of your students are not physically in front of you. Um, and so much of what I'm talking about is based on all the research that's gone on over about 30 years now as distance learning gradually became e-learning, gradually became engaged online learning. And here are some of them. Um, and so really, rather than working out what you're going to do this semester with the group you've got, you need to design in advance for them coming in. That means that if you design it well, you can deliver it many times. Um, you do need to scaffold their learning more. There's, it's a constant source of frustration to all faculty that students don't seem to follow the flow in the same way as they're coming to lectures, tutorials, you're meeting with them, and they're also not meeting casually with each other in the way they do and exchanging information. So you need to put more effort into that cash uh, scaffold, both the knowledge that they need and gradually getting them wor working together. So the way to think about this is to think as online as an alternative campus environment and providing the structure in there that you do already supply on campus, but happens much more naturally and everybody knows how to behave. And then there's this big issue of equivalence. So I, I think if I had a euro for every faculty member over the last year who said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's all OK, Julie, really, but it's not really quite the same, is it? Um, well, no, um, the experience is not the same, but you must ensure that the outcomes are at least equivalent to the way you've always done it. Um, and I think starting with the end in mind is the way to think about that. Um, we've still got some people, Paula, who have not muted. Perhaps you can have a look round and see who they are. It's OK. Um, I'm doing it gradually. OK, thank you. Can everyone mute, please? So, um, it's just I'm getting odd things in my ear. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, so in terms of equivalence, I'm going to talk a bit more about that. But essentially what you're looking for is at least equivalent learning outcomes. And we've got some very interesting statistics on how well-designed designed online learning can not only be just as good, but sometimes even better in some respects. Um, and then the other, probably the biggie that most people have said to me over the last year is, well, how do I know my students are learning? It's not so obvious that they're engaged. Um, how do I know? So a little bit about engagement and how to be sure that you have got everyone's attention, um, that they're aware of your presence in their learning um, and that they are gradually going through a scaffold that will enable them to be the kind of learners uh, that you would wish to have. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about sustainability, because if you're going to put this amount of effort in, whether it's big or small at this point, you don't want it to switch off in the event the pandemic um, is resolved during 2021. Um, you do want to add a lot of value that you can sustain. So a little bit about future proofing. Um, so that's my five areas. So um, here we go. First of all, the design thinking. Um, you don't have to have the diagrams, but I've put them up because I think some of you might be interested in them. And this is basic design thinking. If you're designing a product, a building, uh, an experience, an event, anything like that, um, you do need to actually identify the opportunity and you do need to diverge in your thinking about it. 
And you can't do that without a bit of disruption. Well, we've had the disruption in absolute spades. So you don't need to do any more than what you've already done as thinking, well, there's some things I can't do in the way that I, I've always done. So let it be an opportunity to think differently. And then you need to work out the various things you can do and bring it down to some choices. Because there's literally hundreds of things you can do online, as you know. So one choice I would recommend, for example, that you use your existing virtual learning environment, which is Canvas, which is safe and secure. Sure, you may not do everything you like, everything you want, um, but it's supported. So start with that rather than trying something more fancy. And then you need to determine your response to that. So you need to actually think a little bit outside that box, or in this case, a trying uh, a diamond shape, and work out what's going to work for you um, before you converge down and always start with the end in mind. So like any design process, think about the functionality and what your learners need. Um, so if you don't remember anything else from today, be kind to yourself and allow yourself to do that bit of diverging and converging. It's not always comfortable. And it is actually better done with others rather than on your own. Um, I wrote a blog about this design thinking. I've put it up there. So if any of you are interested on that, there's more to go. Of course, when you're doing it in a practical sense, you do need to observe what your students are doing. You do need to understand why they're doing it that way before you really design your brief. And most importantly, start with the end in mind. Think of what your goals are before you actually do your design thinking. Um, I'll put this one up pretty briefly because if there's systems thinking and data analysts around, there's actually, you can use a lot of data these days. Co-design works better than designing on your own. And of course, what we're involved in, and you know this, but you may not have thought about it, in this way that we have a super super complex adaptive system that is rolling forward in an extremely uncertain environment and that's why it is so difficult to do sustainable designs however if you can try and keep your eye a little bit on future analysis we often find a bit of visualization helps, I'll show you a few examples of that, then you will actually get through this diverge, converge and get yourself into a more comfortable place for your teaching. So, you know, that's a little bit about that. If you're interested in that idea, I'll show you how I turn this into practical workshops, um, which you can definitely do yourself. Um, and your own technology enhanced union will help you to do this. Um, we've actually put all of ours online now. So these are the examples of what it looks like when we were together. Um, and I've got a, a six stages to it, which is actually open on my website. If anyone would like to try it with their colleagues, it's called Carpe Diem um, because you can do it in a day. And it takes you from all the way through that design thinking to an action plan. It doesn't build the course that needs to go into the VLE, but it actually takes you that far. Um, so that's a practical outcome of the design thinking one. Um, and really this is what the outcome of that is. It's storyboarding, it's all the kind of things that we enjoy doing together. Um, and it's also a lot of visualization of the future. I'll just show you this picture because there's a YouTube video. You can see the link there of one we did quite recently with mm, trying to remember how, they, how many there were. It was about 30 or 40 people who did not meet, um, but worked together for just one hour to visualize the future for learning. Um, and you can see they've got the learning technology domain um, they've got the issue of data, they've got online social presence, they've got the challenges in there, and they've kind of come up with this mantra, my time, my location, my mode. So a lot of personalization, but um, it's about mm, 10, 15 minutes that video. But if you're interested in how to work together to get visualization, that will give you a, a strong feeling 
of that. You can see the year is 2026 when the landscape looks like this. So have hope on that. Um, everyone still with me? All right. Yeah, keep going. Um, this is another way of doing a bit of visualising and co-design. Um, this was one, I'm sure they won't mind me saying, the University of Bahrain, which is a very campus-based university and has been very remote over a long period of time because Bahrain has been in serious lockdown. So it's very research, campusly focused, and we managed to get people together to work out what the future will look like for a challenging country and a challenging environment, but very aspirational for their students. So, you know, it's another way that you can get people actually to, to visualize where the future is. And then you have got something to aim for, which I think is one of the things a lot of us are lacking in such uncertain environments. And where you're in a merger situation as you are, it seems to me even more important to be able to do some of this co-design work together. So that's a bit about design thinking. Number two is equivalence. Okay, so what I mean by this is that you should have, if you're changing the mode of how you teach, even if it's in a little way or whether it's a whole way, putting a campus-based course or something that's been largely placed like an apprenticeship in the clients or where there's numerous internships or uh, placements like uh, you're often getting health. You, you're often doing the, all of this in a very different way, either at the moment or in the long term. But you really are looking for the same learning outcomes, which means that you need to be super clear about what those learning outcomes are. You may not, if you've been teaching a course for a while, gone back to them, you'll often find they're not quite what you want. Um, and then you need to provide events, you know, experiences. Think of it as an event, a bit like this one, that provide equal value for learners in different ways. And sometimes if you think about your threshold concepts, these absolutely key pivots that take learners through what you want them to know, that will help you to lead to the desired outcomes. So I don't know how much sense that makes to you, but that's the tip on equivalence. Um, there's another blog, and I can't at the moment see it on there, but I'll make sure you get it, that I wrote in the midst of the pandemic um, about a very large database that proved that if you research and you're in the the in in a position to compare um, online with campus-based learning, you can achieve at least equivalent and often better outcomes. Um, so have faith that you can do that, that you're not downgrading in any way what you're doing, but go back to the design thinking. You need to design that. It won't happen by chance. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of one I've been involved in since last March. So right at the very beginning of the pandemic, I started working with the University of East Anglia, which is in Norwich in the east of England. And there they had a very large health um, department um, and they were running into serious trouble um, with the placements. So. Um, across the 15 allied health professions, um, the first one that was done was occupational therapy. Um, and there were second year students who were not going to be able to progress unless they completed the learning outcomes. Very regulated, um, of course, as most of the health professions are. Um, so this is something we produced, um, um, an e-placement, um, which we, we eventually called Peer Enhanced Placement, or PEEP for short. Um, and it was initially a very fast response um, and was produced in 10 days by storyboarding, by designing, by looking at the learning outcomes which were designated, and then creating a three-week experience which completely replaced the um, on. Um, 
clinical placements that the occupational therapy students did previously. Um, and all of a sudden, we found we had something that did exactly what I've described to you. Um, not only did the students actually achieve the learning outcomes and assessed by all the usual methods by the clinical supervisors that they had achieved those, but also there were some, a range of emergent properties um, such as um, better clinical reasoning, better results in fact, all the things that were important, better peer working, better multidisciplinary working in the online environment. And what we did as a result of that, we built it into a model that other colleagues could then acquire. So I've put the links up there. We've got, um, we've now got e-placements.net, which will show you everything that's happened in the last year um, about these, um, the equivalents um, of these kinds of placements that were actually impossible and actually still very difficult to do. There's a massive log jam um, on them. Um, and we've put together a flip learning package. So uh, colleagues explore their professional standards, um, share the exemplar timetables and work out how to customize them to their needs um, and then receive the materials to deliver them. To date, um, we run one workshop on a Monday. It was delivered to a large group of students um, who were actually dietetics the following week. Um, and that's been going on and is still going on now. Um, it's mainly England and Scotland at the moment, but these workshops are 100% digital. So it's starting to spread around the world. Um, and to date, well, at the end of December, we calculated we had saved or recovered uh, 6,000 weeks of students' placements that would not have happened. Um, without the online and allowed some students to graduate and others to progress. So you can think big and it does work uh, if you've got an appropriate design. So I hope that's um, helpful to you. Um, everyone's still with us all right? Yeah, it looks like, looks like we're okay. Okay, next one, number three. Um, this is what I mean by a scaffold. Um, and this is where you hear people talk about the term pedagogy. Uh, the pedagogist was originally the Greek slave that walked the children to school. Um, I have a feeling the children might have learned more by walking to school than they did when they got there in, in those times. But this was the time, you know, that the term pedagogy and the, the Romans and the Latin roots came about. But it's, you know, obviously from the route a ped to walk. Um, but think about it as a journey. It is a good idea to think about it as a journey and it does help you. And therefore it may help you to think about needing a map, needing various components, perhaps needing to adjust it for the climate that you're in, how long the journey is and the distance. So I, I think, although the term pedagogy sounds a bit strange, I, I think it is quite a useful way of thinking about it. Um, and you do need to build it as a scaffold. So they do start well, but end up in the place that you want them to be. And it's what happens in the middle. Um, and this is where I've got a model of development that I originally developed in the 1990s, in the very early days of online learning, when I was at the UK Open University and I had very large numbers of students online for the first time. In fact, I had 4,000 MBA students all the, around Europe, more than 1,000 of whom had the early days of bulletin boards and online networking to support them. And the research I did then was a grounded model. In other words, what they did with the opportunity anyway. Um, and, and that stayed with me. So if it looks like a blinding flash of the obvious, it probably is because it's fairly natural. It's since been turned into a design framework and still informs all disciplines going through. Um, so it's, a, it's about making sure you've got the individual development in there 
but also building supportive peer teams because that's what really, really works online. Um, and also enable active and interactive engagement, but without losing your presence. And also I'd add to that, not killing yourself in trying to go online all the time, which I'm sure is what a lot of you are trying to do now in order to meet all the requirements. So I'm hoping you'd want to know how to do that. So this is what's called the five stage model. There's loads about it online and I've give you, given you the open website there. Um, but essentially there are five stages to it. <clears throat> And you, when you're designing um, to make your online or blended learning successful, you really need to make sure that all students have got access, but more than that, that they're motivated to come online, not just once, not just twice, but many, many times. Now that may sound like a blinding flash of the obvious, but most people give students quite hard work to do right from the beginning, and then constantly urge them to do it. Whereas if you can set this environment up that's motivating, accessible to all, you'll do a lot better later on. And the next stage from it is building the online peer teams. So it's really what we call um, online socialization. So we're not talking about socializing, um, but socialization sort of, you know, in the academic terms, that they become part of a culture of the way you're doing things and they contribute to it and, and benefit from it. And they do understand something that knowledge is not fixed, but in fact is socialized and applied. So you need to do a few things once you've got them all online that start to give them those ideas. And I'll show you some ways of doing that in a minute. Uh, next one, um, and this is what I would call the cooperative stage. By cooperation, um, I mean that students are working together, but they're typically at this stage still be in pursuit of individual goals. You know this, you know how that is. It's quite common. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll contribute to the team, but you know, will it help me pass the exam? We're all familiar with that. You need to allow them to do a bit of that. Um, before you go on to the real collaborative work. And that's this um, really knowledge construction. So yes, this is a social constructivist principle, the underlying of this. It is a complex adaptive system in its own right too. But I promise you that if you try and build these steps, you'll get nearly all the students doing collaborative knowledge construction work at stage four four and at stage five okay I've called it development but it's really you should start to see signs of these students if they're working well through this five stage model of starting to um, show that they are becoming more mature learners that they're going through those thresholds they're not asking all the stupid questions they're starting to become a more mature learner in your discipline um, and there's depth in, the, in their questions. That's what we noticed um, with the placements, that the kind of things they were asking by the end were quite different from when they were going out on their own, perhaps one-to-one, -one, working in a ward for three to four weeks. They were actually coming back with much more sophisticated questions, demonstrating that they, will start, they were starting to become professionals in the field as opposed to students. So that's the basis of the five stage model. Um, I hope you find it helpful. I'm now going to show you a recipe for deconstructed lemon tarts. And this is because what you need to do with all the things you do on campus is deconstruct them a bit and then put them back together in the online or blended environment. So um, just you can stop and hope it's Nobody's too hungry, but I really like the look of those lemon tarts. Um, but essentially, you've got the building blocks, you've got the pacing, you've got the knowledge and skills that you want students to acquire. You've got the all important assessment and feedback. By the way, you need even more free, frequent feedback in the online environment 
than they you do formally face to face you know on campus and so you need to, lots of little ways of giving them that quizzes peer feedback that sort of thing because it doesn't happen so naturally as it would um, on campus you've got synchronous activity so this is what you would do if you're blended and they're face to face but it's also what you should be doing on zoom you can see zoom is not the whole answer it's just one part of it and then asynchronous activity which is over a little bit of time um, so over a week or so you'll give them something to do that gives them flexibility and works better than 100 percent synchronous and then obviously some independent study but to keep them motivated to keep them working you need to pace that so you've really got to deconstruct your learning into these very components and then put back together the lemon pie approach um, just a little bit i'm still on scaffolding here in case anyone thinks i've gone on to anything else um, you've probably heard of what's called constructive alignment this is a way of then building your lemon pie so the learner constructs his or her own learning through the activities um, but providing them with that scaffold so it actually hangs together so you've got the curriculum the intended outcomes design the delivery the tasks they're all connected to each other now you might be saying oh you haven't got time to do this kind of design I understand that um, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, this was one that people are work. You can also apply the five stage model to uh, Zoom type learning. Um, this was one I picked up in Singapore. It's a nice little blog that shows you how to apply the five stages um, to your Zoom or Teams learning. Um, and I just want to show you that if you do want to have a go at this, um, this is what a storyboard would look like, where you'd put your topics in, you'd put your feedback in, you'd put your online asynchronous activities in, and you put your synchronous, your campus or blend. So it's not too difficult, really, to put it back together again. And that's what it looks like if you do it physically together. The little dots, by the way, are the number of hours that students spend on each thing. Um, and this is what it looks like online. I and mean, when we do workshops where we do um, using Myra online workshops. So I've given you three now, design, um, scaffolding, and I'm gonna go on to engagement. Um, now, often I tell people all of what I've told you already, and then they say, oh, but how do you get students to do it? How do you get them to actually do it? Well, the answer to this is another huge piece of research that was done in the early part of this century. Um, I've published on it and it's really been crowdsourced with all disciplines and all levels of education. At the moment, it's been used in schools all the way through to corporate training and everything else in between. Tomorrow, we've got workshops with some further education colleges, but mostly we're doing workshops in higher education and professional learning. Um, and it has, it's almost like creating an invitation to students to take part, and they've got critical parts to it. Um, there's no time for me to go through it in detail with you at the moment, but again, I've given you the links. I've done lots of videos about it if you want to have a go. Most importantly, it needs to be purposeful. The reason why students will come on and take part is they know why if they do that particular activity, that activity online, how it's going to benefit them. So you don't need to give marks for what they do, but they do need to understand how it will contribute to their learning, how it will contribute ultimately to their assessment. Um, and the other thing to know is the main reason that students will come online is to see whether someone else, either the tutor or a peer, has responded to something he or she has posted before. So you need to create that kind of spiral going through. Um, this is what it always looked like when we were doing storyboards and nativity together. This is what it looks like now. We put it all online and we make it um, 
we make it work together. Um, so again, activities are best designed in pairs or threes if you can. I'll show you the anatomy of them. This is one um, that we've used for science students very recently, it's been very successful, um, is Professor Cox Pedantic, I expect you know Brian Cox. Um, so we, we actually create an invitation for them to take part with the purpose, the task, the spark, questions to them, activities for them. And then there's a contribution to the group. There's always those two stages. And then they know when the tutor or the faculty member will come in, close off the discussion or the activity and add their bit of teaching big advantage, you design this once and you'll know that in a week or two, you'll come in and do something. You don't have to keep going in over that time. I'll just show you a bit of a still from some of the video that goes with this, which is open. So, um, you, you know, use video, use free stuff. You can do a lot of fun events. Right, hope everybody's still with me. There's one more to go, futures. As you're designing this, just keep your eye on the future. Um, I've put um, something I've written there. It was actually, it's, the article is about a year old now, called May the Fourth Be With You. It's the idea that every sector is transforming towards what's been known as 4.0. So medicine, science, industry, business, globalization, politics. Ooh, don't know what's happened to politics recently, but you know, that it's moving forward to a different place. And if you're going to be designing things for students of the future, you need to be in that kind of place. Um, so I hope that if you like the article, it actually tracks um, the Industrial Revolutions one to four, along with um, education revolutions as well. And we are in the midst, definitely of a revolution towards education 4.0. So at least be aware that you're designing for the future, which makes it more worthwhile for you. And again, just another little visualization, um, which was about imagining the future for operating department practitioners. They're called ODPs in the UK. I don't know what you call them. And these are the sort of hidden people in the operating theatres. Um, and this was working with a large group of them, contextualize and understand where their profession is going in the future before we designed the courses for them. So at least try and do a little bit of that um, before you start making your pivot. Um, and this definitely helped us to uh, surface and discuss the, the different contextual aspects. And, um, from that, we got threshold concepts. Um, so we were able to prioritize what we put into the teaching to achieve the learning outcomes. Um, so there's my five design equivalent scaffold engagement and futures. Um, I hope I haven't spoken too quickly, but there is a recording. Just a reminder that we're moving, we're jumping really from this kind of lone wolf, comfortable positions, the way we've always done things, the way we wanted to do things and we knew worked to this rather different future. And I do hope you'll all be there. It's such an important time for you to have a go and to have some understanding at least one of those. Don't forget if you do always to give yourself an action plan. An action plan is really important. Um, we, whatever, whenever we do, um, bigger design workshops, we always make sure we leave with a good action plan that looks something like this. So I've come to the end of my talk. Um, I hope I've left 20 minutes for questions, expressions of horror and disbelief. Um, and I'll have a, I'll tackle what I can. <laughs>